it's my privilege to share one of my best friends with you for an hour. Um, Ray Hinaldo is a neighbor of mine in Minnesota, and I've, as I've gotten to know him over the last 10 years, I've learned a lot about his life experiences. And I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody in my life that has a better reason to be a victim and a better reason to think like a victim than Rahi. And I've never met anybody who thinks less like a victim than Rahi. Um, Rahi always has a smile on his face and he's always looking for an opportunity to improve everybody else's life around him. Um, I don't know how much of his, his ex life experiences he's gonna share with you today in his talk, but um, I continue to be inspired every time I get to spend time with him. He's, uh, he speaks all over the world at this point about the way that he has combined regenerative agriculture using, um, using a, a primarily a chicken-based model, a poultry-based model, uh, to solve not only the problems that I've been solving with cattle for the last 15 years, but social justice problems. And I, I just can't wait to share, for him to be able to share more about the way his brain works with the rest of you. So, Rehi? Thank you. Well, Todd, you should have told me that before. <laughs> I would, um, you almost made me cry there. I, I didn't realize that I, I was supposed to be a victim. Of, but if you had a couple million dollars, I would be happy to play victim right now. Uh, <laughs> So here's, here's the deal. Um, I, I had a hard time figuring out which part of the story I was going to tell you. Uh, I'm a storyteller, so I could tell you 100 ways the same thing. Now, if you want to look at 12 stories, uh, read my book. It's called In the Shadow of Green Man. So Green Man was my imaginary friend growing up. And Green Man was the source of all the wisdom, a lot of the logical frameworks, and a lot of the stuff that nobody else, not even the professors, wanted to talk about, especially during the war when you couldn't even gather in a group of two or three anywhere because that was already a problem for the army. So I'm um, from Guatemala, and I speak for the chickens. <laughs> not in a necessarily what that makes a happy chicken, but what can make us happy if we treat animals and nature the way we're supposed to. So from that perspective, one of the things that I know from the start is that throughout my upbringing, through school, the whole purpose of schooling, the methodology, the systems, and all of that that we go through are designed literally to colonize our minds. To get us to think in a certain way, especially in agriculture, it's a linear way. So you got inputs, you got processes, you got outputs, right? That is the colonized mind right there. Input, process, outputs. So every, every engineering school or in agriculture works from that perspective. Except nature doesn't work that way. Nature is made out of thousands, if not millions of cycles. There is no linear, there is no lines in nature. And so we have forgotten all of that. Now, the reason I call it decolonizing agriculture and that as a foundation of regenerative thinking is because unless we stop thinking that way, it's really hard to be able to regenerate spaces. And so Alejandro and Daniel, the, 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 the story, Alejandro, I met Alejandro a long time ago in Mexico, and we connected really quickly because we connected on a way of thinking. We call that indigenous thinking. Not because it's done by somebody who's named by the UN to be part of an indigenous nation, but because indigenous is about from the ground up, is a way of looking at the world. It's not specific to me as an Achi descendant or Mayan or to natives from this land. All of us can be indigenous if we accept that we have to revert that process of colonization, and we can start thinking that way. That's what makes me indigenous, not my ancestry. So that's really the core of this a message I'm going to go through with you. And so in order to understand 
um, how to decolonize the mind, we have to understand first how colonization works. So the first thing that colonizers do is they discover, right? Then they name their discovery, the new world, regenerative, you know what I mean? Um, I know many folks are trying to pin regenerative to Rodel because apparently he was the first one who wrote it. But well, maybe he named it, but he did not discover it. It was already in front of him, and it was already being practiced by millions of natives in all over the world. That we have to understand. I would not want Rodel to be a colonizer, so I don't want him to be the father of regenerative for that reason because I respect him enough not to turn him into another colonizer, okay? So let's think about that because I know, and, and I, I should have said this at the beginning, um, I speak my mind, I'm a Guatemalan, I am not colonized, I really don't know most of you, um, so I hope nobody gets offended. There's nothing personal about any of the things I'm gonna say. So we then, after we discover these places or ideas or whatever, we create laws, we legislate, we appropriate, we expropriate, and then we appropriate, and then we, we take it on and standardize processes by which we can then, you know, um, repress uh, anybody who disagrees with the new way, and also so that we can exert ownership and control of that, whether it's the United States land or the indigenous knowledge, we transfer it, we appropriate it, and then we come and sell it back to the same people who created the knowledge. That's, and then at the end, we build systems to repress, literally. The, the, one of the reasons we have large armies is because we have to defend a way of thinking, especially, that ensures that ownership and control. And so when, when people on the other end, the other 99% get tired, we need armies. Otherwise, we wouldn't need armies if that discrepancy didn't exist, right? That's the process of colonization, and we are on the last step in this country. So if we're gonna decolonize this, one of the things we have to do is just revert that very thing. We reclaim and rediscover those indigenous systems, that way of thinking. We rename, claim, and secure those indigenous systems. We go and build governance and protection of those processes. We do the same thing except backwards, right? Okay, so the story for today is how we did that with the chicken, all right? So I hope you at least get the, the logic behind here, because otherwise we'll take, we'll, we'll take a lot longer to go through the details in the science and technology that we have brought back into the poultry the engineering as a result of reverting that way of, of thinking. So the first thing is we have to go indigenous, meaning we start from nature's blueprint. And here's something many of you may not like it, but chickens are not pasture animals, okay? There is no such thing as a, that's an oxymoron. I, I learned that word actually uh, recently. Um, it's, a, it's an oxymoron to say that a chicken is a pasture animal because by choice it doesn't choose the pastures. It actually chooses many forages. It's a good forager, but not as pastures. It chooses on the basis of protein and fiber. And that is, pastures have reverted what it wants. So if you want to write a book or a movie, what does the chicken want? I'll tell you what it doesn't want, and then he wants everything else pretty much, especially bugs. But it's primarily a jungle animal. That is nature's blueprint for chickens. And that was our starting point. Not whether the market wanted more inches per, per, per cage, not whether they wanted it cage-free, not whether they wanted it free-range, none of those things. That didn't matter to us. That's linear thinking and that's starting from the opposite end. When you start from the market end, you take two steps and you're satisfied with it and then soon the market changes again. When you start from the other side, you always deliver what the market wants but you never have to compromise. That's what we did here. That's indigenous thinking. So once you understand this, then you can start putting yourself in the right place. So how many of you produce cattle? Okay, how many of you produce pastures? Okay, how many of you produce chickens and eggs? All right, bad news, you don't produce anything. See, nature does. Okay, so if we don't produce things, then w w what's our role? I mean, I'm a farmer and I, I would raise my hand too because I wanna feel like I produce something, but we don't. See, that 
What you did was you used your colonized side of your mind. I produce chickens. I produce cattle. I produce grasses. No, we don't. Flip it, and now you will see yourself as an indigenous person, as an indigenous thinker. I am but a steward of energy from non-edible to edible. And I have nothing to do with the process. Nature already invented it billions of years ago. That's what I do. That's an indigenous way of thinking. So if that's the process, how do you turn it into an actual farm that delivers chickens and eggs and cattle and all of that, okay? But no longer looking at it as producers, but as an energy steward. And this process applies to cattle, elephants if you want to, chickens, it doesn't matter. So for us, we start with the energy as it enters the farm or the region or the country, it doesn't matter. Energy is always moving. Remember, basic laws of thermodynamics. You can not produce the energy, you cannot destroy it, you can only transform it from chemical elements into edible eggs and carrots and nuts and pigs and cows and all of that. First goes through stages like grasses and then turns into something else. But it's just the process of energy. So it enters, it, it enters our little circle, our little mind, but it was always there. It just keeps flowing. So okay, for the purpose of the farm, it enters the farm in the form of feed for us because we are talking about chickens, but for you, it enters in the form of you know, uh, CO2 in the air and all of that, it enters into the grass through photosynthesis, goes into the, all this process, right? So it's, it's no different, it's just a whole different blueprint. So in this place, we put this free range, which we now call tree range, follow that, um, uh, chickens. Then, as you all probably aware, most of the biomass that is produced in trees, the grasses, and all of that, most of it actually comes from the air. If you measure the molecular weights of the soil over periods of time, and this was explained in the book over story, the soil never changes its weight. It's always the same. So almost 100% of the biomass is actually from the air. Let's read uh, Dr. Arden Anderson's book, Life Cycle, I mean, Energy Through Agriculture, if you, if you want the scientific backing for this. So what it means is that we're really managing most of the, that energy that is floating around us. And to manage that, photosynthesis was invented a very long time ago, right? So that's very important because it allows us to think of the forest, the tree ranging system, the canopies above the chicken, the jungle is really, is really the backbone of healthy poultry production. Because that allows for the generation of an environment where the poultry can actually be very, very healthy. Just like Alejandro explained about the cow. It's a very different process, different environment, but that environment, a healthy environment is what delivers us that incredible energy in the form of a healthy, delicious cow. So, Going into that, well, we do have paddocks where the chickens have to be protected and this and that, even though they have the vertical canopies as well. Um, and then we harvest the first layer of energy. For us, this energy comes in the form of um, you know, meat, eggs, hazelnuts, elderberries, oaks. In Guatemala, we have nine species stacked above the poultry system, some of it to produce food for the chickens themselves, most of them are food security for the families and to, and to produce extremely good quality, say, oranges, avocados, um, sapotes, even papayas, and so on. All of that is part of the, of the cycle of a poultry center regenerative design. Now, in Minnesota, we focus on the hazelnut and the elderberry but also we're already putting in the sugar bushes, the oaks, and all of that. We, I live in the center of what is called the Big Woods. That's 160 plus miles wide by about 200 or 300 uh, miles long, depending on which time of the, the history you look at the space. And in that space, we picked the, the woods, the canopies that dominated that landscape so we could restore the native ecosystem as we put the poultry system in. In Mexico, uh, where I met Alejandro, in San Miguel de Allende, it's a whole different story because that's semi-desert and it's high and so on. So the same principle that applies to grazing cattle, where Daniel, I believe his name, um, was explaining that 
you can't just say this square footage per cow, any of that, because that's so defined by all kinds of ecological conditions that have to be factored in before you actually can get to that balancing point. So that harvest of that first harvest of energy is going to be very different depending on where we are. There is always byproducts, so a lot of the cellulose that we are capturing out of that sun, out of that air, and putting it into, whether it's into the ground or into the canopy. And then we have some excess energy out of the mechanical processing here. So like when we process chickens, we end up with, you know, with giblets, with feathers, but especially the manure, because the manure is mostly inside the, 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 the shelter where the chickens spent the night. In the paddock, the chicken defecates very little because it's during the day and they don't defecate as much during the day. They do that mostly when they relax the muscles at night. And so that manure, we get to capture it and put it through another space where there is no chickens. This is the space, the landscape-based management process where we bring perennial crops outside of the paddocks uh, and get the next level of harvesting of energy in the form of alley cropping, grains, vegetables, and so on and so forth. All of it still based on the energy that was, what came in to ignite that process of absorbing energy all the way through from that energy, completely free and available to anybody on Earth. That is the foundation of an indigenous way of thinking about how to raise an animal. And at the same time, we feed all of the vegans. <laughs> Just saying. So, then let's name it now. So we are naming it regenerative agriculture. But remember, it's just a name. We, we are not to claim that. Because this regenerative system have existed before we came around. We're just going to use that as a way to say, OK, so we got the poultry, we got all the perennials, we got all of these systems. And now we can talk about cycles of energy and managing energy and stewarding energy as a, res as a, as a process. Um, yeah, I noticed somebody was looking at the little logo on the bottom. We are tinkering with the idea of certification, so just so you know. So of course, branding is critical. And so at this point, I'm going to introduce Regeneration Farms. Regeneration Farms is one of the operations we set up in Minnesota. We own Tree Range Chicken and Tree Range Eggs. And Jim Klunschmidt, one of our business partners, is back there against the wall, <laughs> literally. Uh, and at the end, if you want to talk about this poultry and the deployment and business partnerships and all of that, Jim is our business development um, uh, director for the company. This is a, the artist's depiction of the system as we deployed it in Guatemala with the different canopies and all of that. This is in an indigenous region up in the highland, the highlands. I did not explain the triple bottom line, by the way. I haven't even said it to you today. They drew it, and they knew exactly what they were going to get out of the chicken. We also have to rebuild that governance. So we are building now an organization where we are bringing a lot of uh, native leaders to help us with the native governance and structures that have to follow not just the actual production engineering, but also the, um, the governance uh, infrastructure. Because we also govern on the basis of colonized minds. This morning, you, at the beginning, you probably heard about the, the money craziness and all of that that goes into so much of what we do. Well, we have to remember that that um, in all of this, the money, the real money is in the energy currency. The real currency is the energy. Because where does a lot of our money go if not into inputs and all of that? So when we think about this, think of as a, as a frugal, actually stingy um, farmer who doesn't want to spend any money on inputs, wants to get the most for their product. Because when you get the most and you spend the least, that's the difference is we call it profit. And so spending money is, should not be an option. And you have to decide as if you're allergic to work. Because work, believe me, I did my share of work in my life. I'm not interested in work. I will work, but only when it's necessary for ma to, to manage energy. So this governance is really critical. And I'll show it to you in a minute how that works. But the 
the key is, remember we talked about the decolonization, part of it is the standardization of processes and the deployment of things at scale. It just happens that the chicken, both, both the broilers and the eggs, gives us the beginning of a very large scale enterprise stacking opportunity, especially because we gotta process that chicken or those eggs, so that's another enterprise sector. And remember, we're not talking just about production enterprise sectors, but in stacking on the farm, but rather stacking beyond the farm, building industry infrastructure. So that meat poultry processing is part of that, uh, uh, s that uh, enterprise stacking strategy. The grain processing is another one, grain production, manure management. When you get enough production, you gotta manage that manure systemically so that it doesn't become a waste product and so on. Also because we needed us in input, uh, energy input for the perennial fields, annual alley cropping, edible foods, and it goes on to the extent that we can integrate between 14 and 20 enterprise sectors on the basis of the chicken and the egg. That is actual systems engineering. Producing on a farm, that's not systems, that's production. You have to then organize the different layers so that we can get to when we actually synchronize the energy that flows throughout a region with the enterprise sectors that capture that energy and keep it flowing to add value and to create this, this incredible wealth that we can generate this way. One of the pieces of the, of the system is that we have to establish a backbone set of services. So at, there's a certain scale at which business planning and management comes into place financial, so engagement of banks at a larger scale, land access management, R&D, training, standardization, verification, market development, a lot of services now that can be, can be delivered efficiently because we got enough scale. And that scale we have mapped it out too. So, alley cropping for example, garlic is one of our main crops coming out of the chicken system. It's a very compatible, nutritionally speaking, that the poultry manure has most of the nutritional profile that the garlic requires. We are producing some of the best garlic in the Midwest now. And I could go on about all of the other derived products of the poultry center regenerative design. Hazelnuts, just like Alejandro said, their mesquite was producing four times more pods than the places where they didn't have cattle. Our hazelnuts are producing four times, literally, four times more hazelnuts per bush than more than 500 cultivars in the Midwest. This is not a coincidence. This is simply good regenerate capacity. Now, in that diagram that I showed you, all the whole SARC cycle, we calculated with Dr. Uh, 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 David Johnson out of um, New Mexico State University, we calculated that we are only harvesting about 30 to 40 percent of all of the energy that we are actually capturing and managing, which means 70 percent of all of that biomass and energy goes back into the system. So we could actually uh, create a matrix, a regenerative matrix, because we are putting back 70 percent of that energy, which seeds the next cycle the next year, which means the next year you get to capture more energy and then you get to see the next cycle. That's what is called regenerative because of energy. It's not because I say so or because you call your products regenerative. That doesn't regenerate thing. Whether it does it is whether your system is energy efficient and it is actually putting more energy into the space than it's taking out. Energy is the currency and is the only measuring uh, the measurement that actually can demonstrate whether a system is regenerative or not. And remember, to be regenerative on the energy basis, it's got to regenerate something. For us, it's the jungle, the ecosystem where the, where the chicken evolved over geological time. That's what we are generating. So what are you regenerating when you do what you do and call your product regenerative? So just a question for you to ponder, I guess. Um, Alley crop grains is also huge, it's very important for us. So in producing regenerative chicken, that means we have to incorporate the whole supply chain. It's not just about how you raise a chicken, it's where the grain came from as well. And so alley cropping grain is central to the concept of our design. The sprouted grain and forages are fundamental components of our regenerative poultry. Why? Because we don't want to be spending money 
on feed especially. If you are a poultry grower, you know that feed is your enemy. It costs you between 60 and 70% of what you get for a pound of chicken or a, or a dozen egg. It goes straight out the door in um, grain supply, feed supply. So sprouts have given us, and forages, has started to give us a tremendous advantage because under this system, we can, uh, we can regenerate the understory at a, at a speed that it can produce a lot of the food for the chicken itself. This is this, the look of one of our canopies, in this case for, with sunflowers, because we have to use, um, during this, uh, while the perennial canopy develops, we use rotation of corn and sunflowers where that's appropriate. In other places, we can use other crops but it produces a full canopy for the chickens so that they get protected completely from aerial predators. We only have lost one chicken in 11 years to a predator, to an aerial predator. That's why, because the chicken, the, the, the predator can't, can't see our chickens because chickens are not supposed to be in open space to begin with. So, um, also, the canopy for us while the perennials develop it's an enterprise as well. This is uh, edible flour corn that we use for tortilla making. Food, people food, very expensive corn. Um, sunflowers, we put them back into the chicken so we could use them for other purposes. The hazelnuts, the oaks, all of those are designed to be also income generators for the farmer. It's not just about the chicken and the meat and the eggs. Our tree range system is based on slow growth breeds from 50 to 80 days. These are um, almost ready to harvest chickens. We don't feed chickens indoors. They're meant to be fed only outdoors, except for the egg layers, because they will still go out <laughs> even if you feed them indoors, but the brothers won't go outside if you feed them inside. Um, Here's an, a, a quick profile. I mean, if we had a workshop, I'll go through the economics, I'll go through details, I'll go through the, the actual agronomics of this, but just to get an idea, in the Midwest, again, in the Midwest, not everywhere else is gonna be the same. One and a half acres is a production unit for us. There is a reason for that one and a half acres. It took us all, over two years to find out where the balance was. Just so you, you know, it's not just pull out of thin air. But in that one and a half acres, we can produce up to 7,000 um, broilers at 1,500 broilers per flock and do it under that cap, you know, regenerating capacity that I was talking about. We can produce about 28,000 pounds a year per production unit. And average, after five years of establishment of the canopies, you know, hazelnuts are on an average of two pounds of in-shell nuts per bush. So in, we had about 1,000 bushes per one and a half acres, that's 2,000 pounds. Just to give you an idea of that extra productivity that we can get. In fact, in the, in the last two years, I haven't bought um, oil because that's one of the things I started extracting out of the hazelnuts that our chickens are producing now at a, a rate of four times better productivity per bush than if we didn't have the chickens. Uh, extrapolate that to any crop you want, except uh, with a little caveat, it's got to be nitrogen hungry. And if it fixes its own nitrogen, it's kind of, you know, doesn't, doesn't quite do it because then it won't use the nitrogen from the, from the chicken. Hazelnuts, they are not legumes, so they don't fix the nitrogen, but they need in excess of 30, 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So it's a perfect combination. That's how you have to think about this. It's not just a recipe, like we said before. You have to really think this stuff through. But once you're done, it's incredible because you're then managing energy. We never weeded or fertilized these hazelnuts because the chickens do all of that. Egg production, we put up to 8,000 egg layers per unit at 4,000 per flock backed up against each other so we can mechanize feeding, mechanize watering, and mechanize egg collections. Again, we don't want to work on those things if we don't have to, and we shouldn't be collecting eggs by hand if we're going to deploy an actual industry that is regenerative. Uh, remember, bones don't regenerate very well, uh, especially when you're after 60 or so, you start feeling it if you're collecting eggs you're, you know, for many years. And we want to think, of, I want to be you know, working on this when I'm 90, if I ever get there. Uh, so I want to design for that too, and that's why we are trying to make sure that these efficient levels, good um, um, uh, numbers, although this is peanuts compared to what an industrial system will deploy is still good enough 
for, for this industry we are deploying. And also because it's not just about the eggs, it's also the whole system that we're talking about and the economics of the whole system, not just the economics of the eggs and the chicken. So this allows us to produce you know, up to eight, you know, um, 182,500 dozen a year at about 70% of efficiency, which is actually the average because it goes up higher than that in the peak and then drops again. So average is you know, 65, 70%. Um, and a total of around 5,000 bushes per every six acres that required, is required for these egg layers, again, in the Midwest. In San Miguel de Allende, we don't go above 2,000 birds per flock, and we put a lot more space outside because the breeds there also roam a lot farther from their buildings too. So there's all kinds of considerations like that. Um, but for Minnesota, this is... Um, this is a general profile, so you can have a, a, a much clearer idea of this. Um, now, a farm doesn't make a system. In fact, you can't even deploy a poultry processor with a farm or two or three or 10. You have to have volumes to be able to justify even a mobile processor like we just did in Minnesota. Um, so that's what we talk about clusters. For broilers, we're talking about 200 production units. That production unit I just showed you. 250 to, to get to that level uh, this is time pro improperly, so I'm going to just go put it here. Okay, so it's at least 1.7 million broilers. Uh, that's the baseline. From there, we can start growing. But below that, it just doesn't make sense to set up a processor. I mean, we have to do it now, but it, it still won't make sense until you get beyond a certain level. Um, for egg layers, a cluster is 30 production units. That's 65.7 million eggs, 800 acres engaged, and... Um, a total of around 7,000 or, or 7,100 acres involved in one uh, baseline cluster. This is again not the, the whole business plan. This is where the minimum threshold we got to meet really quick, otherwise we, we keep losing money. Um, so again, in the value added production uh, of the hazelnuts, the alley crop grain, the alley crop vegetables, timber, nuts, biomass, all of that, we can start adding it to the foundational egg and meat equation, economic equation. One thing I got to remind you is that um, we also open up all of the options for improving productivity of the, the chicken itself and the health of the chicken when we put it back in its natural environment. So forages, for example, we are starting to reduce significant amounts of the feed ration into the chickens because we are able to bring them a lot more forages that we couldn't do if we didn't have this kind of system. Um, the, the, the process of reclaiming, protecting, and expanding indigenous ways of thinking, for us it was simple. We put the proof of concept together based on this logic, we develop a farm, and now we're developing a regional system in Minnesota, in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. We are uh, starting to work with Fairfield, Iowa. We developed another center in uh, San Miguel de Allende. Uh, we are studying British Columbia. Uh, the, the, the Pine Ridge Reservation is already working and delivering products. And the one in San Miguel de Allende is delivering products all the way to Mexico City. And we have two different regional deployments now in Guatemala, besides our deployment in Minnesota, which uh, looks like this. You know, you get the proof of concept unit, two paddocks, perennial canopies, fences for the outside to protect them from daylight. Uh, predators in the building to, pr to protect them at night and to mechanize feeding, uh, watering, and the basic things that will require a lot of work, but doesn't have to because the chicken is free all day long, all the space it wants. So it's not really that complicated at the end of the day. Now, you move that in, into a farm design. This is our first regeneration farm operation. It's a 32-acre place. Here are the four production units on the south. All of this mapped out. This, this one is already in production. We're building the other three this year. Uh, and this is the alley cropping systems. All of this is a self-contained, continuously circling energy system. There's no other input here than grain and stuff that we have to bring from outside. So the regional deployment again, farm clusters means we aggregate all of those sectors that I talked about, but now we are talking about those, you know, 250 broiler farms, 30 production units of eggs, and then from there we can grow this larger, um, you know, checkerboard of uh, stacked enterprises. Um, 
we calculated that for every dollar that we invest in a system that is fully integrated like this, we can generate up to $12. Right now, the agricultural system in southern Minnesota's 36 counties, according to the Rural Policy Research Institute, generates 75 cents for every dollar we put into it. That's, that's the current math that they came up with. B you know, building industry-level governance and support systems. There is a lot of interest in this way of thinking because it really can change the equation. The millions of dollars that are being spent by Toledo, by Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Toledo, Ohio, on cleaning up all the nitrates in the water and all of that, after the water was cleaned to begin with. All of that money that is going into into from the government, taxpayers, and all of that into fixing problems that we created ourselves um, can be avoided if we create, build proper governance and support systems. And we have come to the point that there is a lot of goodwill now, and these systems can you know are gaining more uh, interest because we can fix a lot of those expenses that should we should never have to be paying for. Um, one of the big things we did in terms of building this, this industry-level governance and infrastructure is that we launched the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. I mean, we haven't launched it, we created it, we staffed it, um, we, we got some seed capital from, from a, um, um, one of the Regenerative Agriculture funders. Um, we also um, got some of the, the um, uh, key pieces that we need to put next in order to coordinate the poultry with the other regenerative sectors. And so the alliance is going to, we're going to launch it formally in December at the Acres USA uh, convention in Minneapolis. But meanwhile, we have set it forth so that we can concentrate on implementing the backbone infrastructure of this poultry center regenerative agroforestry system, we call the PCRA, and scale it in collaboration with the other regenerative sectors. Um, those sectors include native bison we're working with, agroforestry sectors, you know, uh, folks from um, um, from um, uh, ventures, uh, what's <laughs> propagate, propagate venture uh, folks from the agroforestry systems, um, our poultry center, of course, other allied sectors. I mean, you probably wonder at the beginning, what, what's a chicken guy doing at a grass-fed conference um, uh, here in the West Coast? And the reason, part of the reason, is because we have to bring these sectors together if we're going to build. Uh, industry-level influence and infrastructure. And so native foods, fish, fruits, wild rice, for example, in South Dakota, we're already looking at the buffalo um, cher cherries. Um, many of the fruits that they had uh, allowed to dwindle, now we can bring them back on the basis of the poultry and then build the stepping stone so that they can then further develop their ability to do the bison because the bison takes a long time and we gotta feed everybody meanwhile. Well, we can do that with chickens and eggs. That's why we went into Pine Ridge. You see the logic there, it's pretty simple actually. We can redo these national systems that have deteriorated so bad if we can just flip those switches Stop looking at ourselves as producers, stop looking at ourselves more as energy stewards. We stop looking at the market as the beginning of everything because guess what? The market changes its mind every time we accomplish what we thought it wanted anyway. Um, and I know that 99% of the total US population probably doesn't care too much about this stuff right now. Mm, some of them are probably right here in this room. But the key is, this is the only way we're going to make it. There is no way to engineer our food, number one, because our gut is the foundation of our health, and our gut responds to real stuff. It doesn't respond even to cheap food, fast food, none of those things. It actually degenerates our own ability to, to live when we do that. Eventually, maybe not yet, but eventually, we're going to come to that realization. And when we do, we have to have alternatives. That's what we're in this business. So we got 12 minutes for questions, and I hope you got, you got I, I triggered some, some thinking here so we can engage.